The pyramids at Giza, enigmas, mystical shapes, royal tombs, even the work of the devil, depending upon the degree of intellect at work trying to explain them. There are enough books in print about these monuments, most particularly the Great Pyramid, to fill a small library, almost all of which attempt to explain their purpose. Mostly they assert personal beliefs. Those that sound good to other thinkers are echoed, and echoed, until they work their ways into the realm of accepted fact. Typical is the continuing assertion that they, along with all the other pyramids in Egypt, about 83 to date, were tombs for the ruling class. For many, the bait has been taken. They are tombs. Despite the fact that we have yet to find the remains of any pharaohs in any of them. Well, if Egypt's pharaohs built these pyramids, they were a whole lot better advised in mathematics, geodetics, and astronomy than the written record is able to support. In the absence of written records, we depend on archaeology for answers at Giza. But archaeology lives to dig, to find the tangible handheld artifacts of early people. Unfortunately, digging will never answer the reason for pyramids. The pyramids are mathematical law. They represent intelligence, and intelligence isn't buried. It's left for all to see, above ground and in clear sight. Sometimes they even left stuff laying around that was so obvious we can't see it. For example, matrix vector GV, my code for Giza vector. The two sets of smaller pyramids, 4, 5, and 6, and 7, 8, 9, were aligned to point right at it, an intersection of azimuths. But the builders left nothing, no pyramid, no stakes, nothing at Vector GV. Now why'd they do that? To make the obvious unobvious, obviously. And of the hundred odd books I have digested on the Giza Pyramid site, not one discusses this silent, unmarked point. Indeed, they fail to even speculate on why the small pyramids were laid out in straight lines. It went right by everyone. We already have the grid figures for these two azimuths. 41,252.96 comes from Mexico's Juliaco, the surface area of a 360 degree sphere. And the square of the megalithic yard, 7.39685. Dividing the two figures, we are left with GV's value. 5,577.096018. It will serve to demonstrate that we can get something from nothing, GV, if we know the language. Since Stonehenge explained the language, there's nothing holding us back. So let's go for it. Three pyramids present each of these invisible lines to vector GV. That's 3 pi in the language. Apply it and find the grid longitude of Stonehenge, 52,562.89. There are two sets of pyramids involved. That's 2 pi which finds us the square root of the volume of the 360 degree sphere exactly. Or we can drop pi and divide by the double radian to retrieve the exact radius of Stonehenge in feet. We also have the option of applying the square root of 15 from Stonehenge from which prints out the grid latitude of same. In all, six small pyramids point to GV. That's six pi. Testing, we find the grid longitude of the Sinsunsan pyramid in Mexico, the 3,100 foot long Sinsunsan, the world's longest pyramid.
The tallest pyramid in the world is the Great Pyramid. Good longitude, 360 degrees. Apply it to vector GV and we retrieve 15.4919. There's a new number for the pot. And coming off the Great Pyramid, it must have been important. It was. 13 square miles of importance. They laid an entire city out on this azimuth. Teotihuacan in Mexico. Math can be used either extensively or expansively. We have seen how 3 pi responds to vector GV. Now let's turn it around and raise pi to its third power, the cube of pi. Applying it, we find the grid latitude of Monk's Mound at Cahokia, Illinois, North America's largest pyramid. Not bad for a silent guide. See, they didn't have to mark vector GV, just align something toward it. Too bad it took us so long to wonder about it.